Topic 3.1 Thermal Concepts. Okay, our first thermal concept is the idea of temperature. And it's really important that we understand what temperature actually measures, and then in a practical sense, how do we measure this thing called temperature. So our first way of thinking about it, and this is just very simplistically, we'll, we'll develop a little more specific definition a little bit later, but just in a simple sense, the temperature of an object is the hotness or coldness of that object. And that's very intuitive. I'm sure you, you kind of have a sense of, of that as far as the temperature goes. <clears throat> in a practical sense, how do we measure the temperature of an object? Well, obviously, I'm sure you know we use thermometers to do that. And for a thermometer to work, it has to somehow measure a property of the object that will also change as we change the temperature of the object. And typically there are three important things that tend to change in an object depending on its temperature. And most importantly is the expansion or contraction. When objects are heated, they expand, and when they're cooled, they contract. This is, for example, the concept behind a hot air balloon. They simply heat the air inside the balloon, the balloon becomes less dense, and therefore it floats against the rest of the air that's in the surrounding environment. We can also use electrical conductivity. There's a number of thermometers, newer thermometers, that use electrical conductivity. And then if we were using a gas, of course, the gas pressure will change. As you heat it up, the pressure increases, and as you cool it down, the pressure decreases. <clears throat> but the first thermometers used the expansion and contraction idea, and the first thermometer used mercury, but today we don't use mercury because it's a toxic uh, material. And so today we use alcohol thermometers, but they both work on the same principle, and that is that they expand or contract as their temperature changes. And so if you can imagine, a thermometer like this with a with a pool of mercury down here at the bottom and the mercury filling up filling up the bottom okay now that's that's fine that the mercury expands and contracts and you could see that the temperature was hotter or cooler but uh, Andreas Celsius wanted to be able to put numbers on this and so to do that he needed to have fixed points and you need to have two points in order to do that one point won't do it but if you had two points then you could create what you would call a scale or a temperature scale so what he did was his first scale was the freezing point of water so if you put So if you put water in a bucket or in a container and you fill it with ice cubes, the water temperature will get cooler and cooler. And when you put your thermometer in there, what you'll see is that the thermometer will go get shorter and shorter and shorter. It'll shrink down inside of the tube. But you will find after a while that it stops. Even though there's still ice melting in there, you'll find that it stops. The water will not go below a certain point once you reach that point. Now, it's a little minor um, point, but he actually called this point 100 degrees. But today, we've kind of reversed the scale, um, and we now call this the zero point. So the zero point for the Celsius scale is called the freezing point of water. So then he took the same thermometer and he put it in a container filled with water and he heated it up and he heated it up until the water began to boil. Now another interesting thing happens when water boils. Once it reaches its boiling point it will not go higher than that. And so he found that it came up to a much higher point, but once he reached that boiling point, once again, the thermometer stopped changing temperature, and that created another fixed point, the boiling point of water. And that today we call 100 degrees. And so 
it was f very easy for him to find a substance that expanded and contracted. And in just a little minor note, in the early thermometers, they were not closed the way the thermometers that you would buy today. They were open to the air. So one of the things that Celsius really liked about mercury is that it didn't evaporate. He could have this tube remain open and the thing would not evaporate. Because if I used, for example, alcohol in an open container, I would find that the alcohol would slowly disappear out of there and I'd have to constantly be refilling the, the thermometer with alcohol. So mercury was a particularly useful substance to use in the early thermometers because in the early open thermometers, they would continue to work even in an open thermometer. Okay? Now the, the trick about this whole thing though is that the thermometers are actually not measuring the substance they're in. For example, the water, the boiling or the, or the freezing water. Um, thermometers are actually measuring their own temperature. Thermometers are measuring their own temperature because what we're really seeing is that as the temperature of the mercury changes, the mercury expands or contracts. So what we're really seeing is the changing temperature of the, of the mercury. So now if the thermometer is actually telling its own temperature, then how is it that we say that that's the temperature of the substance that it's in? Well, that brings us to a concept called thermal contact, and these are just a few definitions that we need to understand in order to really go deeper into this topic. So thermal contact simply means to be in direct uh, contact with another object, and this allows you to exchange some of the energy that's in that, that temperature, or as a result of that temperature. If you place two objects in thermal contact, they will eventually reach what's called thermal equilibrium. And this is when the two objects that are in thermal contact achieve the same temperature. The measure of whether they are in equilibrium or not is whether they are at the same temperature. How do they reach the same temperature? Well, very simply, they exchange a form of energy called heat. So heat is a form of energy that's transferred between two objects due to the fact that they have a difference in their temperature. Now, technically speaking, objects that are at the same temperature still continue to change heat but they do so in such a way that they exchange equal amounts. So, for example, if I give a person a dollar and they give me back 50 cents, and we keep making that exchange, then eventually the amount of money that I have will go down and the amount of money that they have will go up. But if I give them 50 cents and they give me 50 cents and we make that exchange over and over, then nothing happens. Neither one of us increases or decreases the amount of money. And this is very similar to what's happening with the temperature where they continue to exchange heat even once they reach the same temperature. They still continue to exchange heat, but they exchange the same amount, and so therefore their temperature will no longer go up or down. So, and let's draw this in sort of pictorial form. We place two objects in contact a hot object and a cold object. So heat always wants to flow from the hotter object to the colder object. So I may see that there is heat flowing in this direction. Until eventually Neither object is hot or cold, they're simply both warm. They've achieved the same temperature. And at that point, the amount of energy that's going from the object on the left to the object on the right is equal to the amount of, of energy that's going from the object on the right back towards the left. They ch exchange equally and the temperature no longer changes. Now, to understand a little bit more clearly what temperature is actually measuring, we need to start thinking about the two forms of energy that, that substances have internally. That is to say, when I move a pencil, this is external energy. This is a result of some outside force that is causing the pencil to move. But when we think about the temperature, temperature is not a result of this. For example, I'm not changing the temperature by moving it back and forth like this. Now, being in thermal contact with my hand will increase the temperature, but this motion back and forth is not changing its temperature at all. That's an external form of energy. We would call that kinetic energy. But that's external kinetic energy. So in terms of thinking about what's happening to a substance internally, it turns out that substances do have kinetic energy internally as well as whatever they have externally. So the internal energy of an object is called is a result of the total amount of kinetic 
and potential energy of the molecules. Okay, now all the molecules are making this motion. But if I look at the individual molecules, they're not all making the exact same motion. And this should be clear to you from chemistry, and that is that all the molecules in any substance, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas, are all moving. They're all in constant motion. And so that kinetic energy is a result of that motion. Now that motion could be very simple. They might just vibrate or shake in place. They literally shake back and forth in place because in a solid object of course they're not free to move around. In a liquid object we get other types of kinetic energy also available to us. They can vibrate, they can still shake and stay in the same location but they're also able to rotate. In a solid object the particles would not be able to rotate and then they can also move and this is called translational motion that is to say that they can move, they can wind their way throughout the, the liquid object because they're no longer bound to any of the particular atoms around them. So that gives us three types of kinetic energy, the vibrational kinetic energy, the rotational kinetic energy, and the translational kinetic energy. So of course liquids have more kinetic energy. That should make sense because to become a liquid I have to gain heat. I have to have heat added to me to go from the solid to the liquid state. And so these liquids have a little bit more kinetic energy. In addition to that, there's also in a gas the same types of energy that you would see in the liquid, just they tend to be a little bit more. So the molecules can still vibrate, they can rotate, and they can fly around. Now in this case, they don't simply just wind their way. In a liquid, the, the, to move around, they, they sort of need to push past other people because they're all sort of shoulder to shoulder. But in a gas, they're no longer in contact with any of the other atoms or molecules around them, and so they literally fly around. In fact, in most cases, in a gas, they rarely run into anybody else except for the walls of the, of the container. And so the kinetic energy of the, of the object is a result of these various types of motion, whether it's vibrational, rotational, or translational motion. The kinetic energy is a result of the fact that every molecule in a substance is constantly in a state of motion. Now that takes us, tells us about the kinetic energy of it, but what about the potential energy? What's the potential energy based on? So it turns out that the potential energy of a substance is based on the forces between it and it increases as the distance between the molecules increases. Now in a gas the molecules have the most distance between them so we would say that has the most potential. In a liquid there's a little less potential. The molecules are much closer to each other. In fact they're in contact with each other they're just not bound to each other. They're not forced to stay stuck together. And in a solid we would have the least potential. Everybody is as close as they can possibly get in the solid substance. Now, frequently, you'll hear them in other books, although in the book that we're using, they don't tend to do it. Internal energy and thermal energy are generally considered to be the same thing, but internal energy is really the proper way of thinking about it. Internal energy is the combination of the kinetic and the potential energy of the individual molecules in any substance. But you'll oftentimes hear them used interchangeably with the word thermal energy. Now, this brings us to a, a point about the temperature and what temperature really is. And so we need to talk about the absolute temperature scale and this is called the Kelvin scale. For Lord Kelvin. And so the Celsius scale chose the zero point to be the freezing point of water. But the absolute temperature is scale is based on the lowest possible temperature. That is to say that if you lower the temperature of an object it will reach some minimum temperature. And this brings up the point that there really is no such thing as hotness or coldness as we used in our first definition. In our first very simple definition, we simply use the hotness or the coldness as a measure of temperature. But in reality, there is no such thing as coldness. There really is only hotness. And that is to say that you have thermal energy or you don't have thermal energy. If you have more thermal energy, then you might be hot. And if you have less thermal energy, then you would be considered cold. In a similar way, if I remove all of the thermal energy, if I remove every bit of the thermal energy of an object, then its temperature would be at what's called absolute zero. It has no thermal energy and therefore it has no kinetic energy. And so this brings up what temperature really is. Now to make that conversion from 
Celsius to Kelvin, we simply add 273 degrees. It turns out that at minus 273 degrees Celsius, we have reached absolute zero, there is no more thermal energy to remove, and the molecules stop moving. The motion of the atoms stops. They have no um, translational, rotational, or vibrational motion. They simply stop. Now, the absolute temperature is much more useful than the Celsius temperature because the absolute temperature can be tied directly to the motion of the molecules. And that is to say that the absolute temperature is a direct measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Now notice I didn't say potential or internal energy. Temperature simply measures the average kinetic energy of the molecules. I cannot stress how important that is. That's what temperature is really measuring. It's measuring how fast the molecules are moving internally so this is extremely important that you understand and this is why the absolute temperature scale is much more useful and so what's really nice about this this concept of temperature is that it allows us to connect something that's happening on a microscopic scale to something that's happening on a macroscopic macroscopic means on the big scale so on the microscopic scale what we're really measuring is the kinetic energy and the way that we do that because that would be very difficult for us to go in and measure the average kinetic energy of the individual molecules but what we can do is on the macroscopic scale on the big scale we can very simply put a thermometer in this object and it will tell us the temperature of the object and we know that the temperature is a direct result of the average kinetic energy of the molecules some have more some have less but on average they have a certain amount and that corresponds to a certain temperature for that substance